Welcome back to Brock's Hammer, everybody, and today we're going to dive into how to deal with melee armies in Pry Nexus. So this is a topic that I've gone over quite a bit in my videos about screening out enemy units and stuff like that. You'll hear me mention this many a time. I think it's a very important skill for any Eldar player to learn because it's essentially how we're going to win a vast majority of our games. So if you're an Eldar player out there and you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't want to have to worry about screening and doing all these things to move block and stuff like that, then you're probably just not going to win a lot of your games against a serious opponent. And I know that seems a little bit extreme on the outset of this video, you know, starting the video off with, if you don't screen, you're going to lose your games, blah, blah, blah. But I just want to be straight up with you guys, a lot of how the Eldar win games, whether you look at competitive play or even semi-competitive play with, you know, your competitive gaming group or, you know, even just your friends. At the end of the day, it's going to come down to how well you can screen out your opponent's biggest threats. And this wasn't the case at the beginning of the edition for the Eldar. So a lot of people who got into Eldar at the beginning of the edition, there was kind of a refresh in interest. They were doing very well in tournaments. They were very strong. They had a lot of very fun mechanics that people like to play with. And that they weren't necessarily abusing in their local game store. They were just using it to the best effect. And they were having a lot of fun. And I think at this point in the game, we've seen a string of nerfs to our faction. And unlike the very beginning of the edition, the strengths of the Eldari now lie firmly with very technical play. And technical play means moving your units in the right positions, screening effectively, and of course eliminating the proper targets in the proper order in which you need to win the game. Now, having said all that and kind of given you guys a preamble into kind of where the Eldari are at, and by the way, if you guys are, you know, a little bit disillusioned with the Eldari after all the nerfs, it's definitely okay, but I can tell you guys as somebody who's played the Eldar so many years and through terrible editions, and uh, guys, I have to say, if you've ever played them near the end of 5th edition, you'll know what I'm talking about. There was essentially only like four or five units out of the vast array of units in the Eldari Codex at the time, or Eldar Codex at the time. They weren't the Eldari back then. But, you know, that were actually usable, right? A lot of the units were just flat-out unusable garbage. In competitive settings, that is. In, in casual settings, there was a lot of units that were pretty decent that you could have a lot of fun with. But in competitive settings, it was a shark tank, and, you know, there was basically only one maybe two kind of variations on a build that you could, you know, pick up for competitive play. And that is just not the case anymore. So I'm coming in this with a different mindset. As you guys know, the Eldari win rate is down to like 47, you know, low estimates, 46%, which is one of the lowest in the game right now. Just to be straight up with you guys. Now, I do think Eldar have a lot of power, again, in that technical style of play. I think you do need to play to their strengths as a faction. You can no longer rely on superior firepower because our stuff is just too expensive. There's a lot of armies that can just outshoot us if we plan on playing that kind of game. In addition, and this kind of comes to the topic of this video, melee armies are on the rise in Pari Nexus. This is no surprise. The deployment zones on several of the you know different deployment types are closer together. So you're of course going to get melee armies that are you know seeing a lot of buffs as well with the new types of terrain that is available for them to hide behind and stuff. They're going to gain a lot of power from those changes. And in my opinion, it's one of the reasons why GW selected heroic intervention to be brought down to one command point. Because they knew they had to, you know, kind of introduce some sort of counter to these melee armies that were going to start dominating the field. And of course, there are a couple of armies in particular that saw an extreme benefit to this. So I want to briefly talk about this before we kind of move on into the video proper, but Dark Eldar is probably the worst example of abuse that has come from Pariah Nexus. The fact that they can just kind of pivot and then charge, you know, with the raiders out of Deep Strike and stuff is really insane. It's a cheese that is not yet addressed by GW. And yes, guys, unfortunately, this is how it works in competitive play. I know a lot of people in the comments will say that it doesn't work like this or, you know, it's not intended. It's, you know, only cheese mongers would use this kind of, you know, interaction. And that may be true at your local game store when you're playing a pickup game against somebody. But in a tournament, competitive setting, people are going to use these 
you know, kind of cheeses. So, you know, that is why the Dark Eldar, one of the reasons why they have such a high win rate. The other reason, of course, being that Archons now basically all get the, you know, Lord of Deceit ability where, you know, 12 inch bubble around them, plus one to any command point costs for your opponent, which is pretty powerful. But there's also other armies that are dominating the battlefield, Blood Angels, Space Wolves, you know, power armor armies that are reliant, or should I say, are good at close combat, and that can get up the field quickly. It's funny because Space Wolves, Thunderwolf Cavalry just got nerfed, but with these new board deployments, it almost doesn't matter. Space Wolves are still going to be running Thunderwolf Cav. You know, you're still going to see units of Thunderwolf Cav and Space Wolf armies, and they're doing very well. Blood Angels are doing very well because they all have jump packs and they can all get across the battlefield very quickly. So this poses a real threat to the Eldari, who are a fragile faction. We do not like getting closed in in our own backfield. If we get closed in our own backfield, we've lost, essentially. If we have no, you know, kind of way to make space in order to use our greater mobility, because that is our greatest strength. So how do you deal with these types of armies? Well, there's a couple different ways in which I plan to go over this in my video today. And hopefully this is going to help some of you guys out there who are struggling with these types of ultra-aggressive melee armies. So in this video today, we're going to be talking about the evolving meta of the Pry Nexus Mission Pack. Doing a quick overview of that, we're going to be talking about some of the effective anti-melee units available to the Eldari, and how to counter melee armies as the Eldar in Pry Nexus. So as I said before, the evolving melee meta that has come out of Pry Nexus is tied to several different things, one of which being the deployment layouts, which are much closer together than in Leviathan, leading to possible turn one charges from faster and more devastating units. There's more hiding spaces, the terrain is denser, etc. Also, several melee armies were already on the rise during the last weeks of Leviathan, and the new deployments have made them even more powerful. Specifically, those armies I mentioned before, you know, the Space Wolves, Blood Angels, and Dark Eldar, but also Orcs and Chaos Space Marines are powerful. They're not doing too well in competitive play right now as far as the win rates go, and I think that's just because they got nerfed pretty heavily across the board. But even so, they are powerful armies to deal with if you don't know exactly what you're doing against them. So this may be leaving some of you guys to think, well, what are some of the effective anti-melee units available to the Eldari? Like, what can we do against this melee threat? And a lot of you are just simply going to say, well, it's just not our time. You know, it's we've we've gone over so many nerfs. What could we do? We can't do anything. Well, actually, we have a lot of units that maybe some of you have kind of written off in your mind as just garbage units that, you know, aren't good and that won't be, you know, effective in your army or whatever it is. that are actually really good at stopping hardcore melee threats like Thunderwolf Cavalry or even Incubi from the Dark Eldar. We have several units in our army that are adept at screening enemies early in the game and that are cheap like Rangers and Shroud Runners who can infiltrate and scout up the board to block movement lanes. And especially if you go first, which I know you won't always go first, but if you go first, you have a great chance of being able to block off your enemy's first turn completely with move blocking. Rangers, of course, can infiltrate up the board and do this very easily. Also, striking scorpions can do this in a pinch. And they can take something out in addition. So what happens if you don't get first turn? Well, if you don't get first turn, you're still limiting your enemy's movement. They're not going to be able to advance as far up, right? They're limited to basically a two-inch advance, if you think about it that way. And on top of that, yes, they could charge your rangers and stuff, but it's probably going to leave them in a position where they're not exactly safe from enemy shooting. Whereas if you didn't have those rangers there, they'd be able to comfortably move their unit behind obscuring terrain and stage for the next turn. They can't do that if you're screening properly. Now, what if screening is not enough? A lot of people have said, well, you know, I have my rangers and stuff, but it just seems like there's too many melee units to deal with. You know, I don't want to take six units of rangers in my army. So how do I deal with units that actually do get to my front lines? And that is actually a good question, right? Screening is not effective against things with fly that have insane movement values. You know, things with jump packs that are advancing. It's just not going to be very effective in general in the movement phase. Although it is effective in the charge phase because keep in mind that a charge move itself is not considered a normal move. I know it may seem like it is, but a charge move is a charge move. It's not an actual normal move, so it's not affected by fly. This is something I learned the other day when reading through the core rules again, because, 
you know, I thought it worked like that, but I just wanted to double check because, <laughs> you know, people get things wrong from time to time. So that means if you're trying to screen out flying units, you're just going to have to screen out a little bit deeper, closer to their intended target so that they charge your rangers instead of whatever unit you're trying to protect. Now, having said that, there's also another way in which we can just straight out protect the units that get charged. We have several cost-effective fights first units who are very strong against fast-moving melee units like jump pack infantry and can cheaply or freely use heroic intervention to protect your fragile units. The Visarch with Quins is a great example of this. You can have a unit with the Visarch, maybe even your Vrain in there and Quins, heroically intervene into a charging unit and just completely wipe them out in the charge phase. This also gives you more movement for your next turn. So, you know, if you need to get them up to an objective or something like that, or you need to charge an enemy, you know, kind of bastion defending an objective, you will be closer to doing so, which is nice. But of course, the main reason we do this is because we're going to strike before our enemy and we're going to deal so much damage to that unit that they're not going to be able to strike back or they're not going to be able to strike back effectively. Howling Banshees are also good at this. Now, Howling Banshees don't do that much damage by themselves. They kill about three, maybe four Marines on average, which is just enough to make sure that that unit is ineffective when it fights. For example, you know, a unit that has been reduced to one or two models is not going to be able to kill an entire unit of Swooping Hawks or Warp Spiders. They're just not going to be able to do it. So... You know, they might kill one or two warp spiders, but your warp spiders are still effective enough to score on secondaries and so forth. Janes are, however, when you add them to Howling Banshees, all of a sudden the unit becomes pretty strong and can easily wipe out a unit of five marines charging in no problem. They can even threaten bigger units as well. And also you have the Solitaire, which is perhaps the greatest and most versatile fights first unit that we have access to. Not only is he the cheapest unit, but he does a ton of attacks, he's easily able to kill five marines, no problem, and he's a lone operative, so he won't be vulnerable to shooting in the next turn. You can move him somewhere else, of course, because by then it'll be your own turn. And the lone op makes him, you know, resistant to things like overwatch and stuff at a certain range, and, you know, he can score objectives, or he can go after a different target. The solitaire can easily wipe out two five-man assault marines by himself, easily trading up for his cost, but also making it hard for your opponent to deal with him if placed correctly. And although she's a little bit more fragile, Lilith too. If you are playing the Inari, Lilith is a great fights first unit that you can use in conjunction with witches to annihilate an enemy unit that comes in for only one command point. All of these units are great for this. So you might be thinking, well, yeah, proxy hammer, but you know, I can only do this to one unit a turn, right? So like, how am I going to stop five or six units from the enemy army coming into me on turn one. Now, for this, I would simply say that you have to layer your screening and your heroic interventions in such a way that your opponent is not going to be able to easily make those choices. Believe it or not, if you deploy your army correctly in any of the different deployments, your opponent is not going to be able to charge six assault marine units into your army on turn one. There's going to be some units that just can't make the charge. Either they don't roll high enough, or they just simply can't. So if your opponent starts off with, let's say, six five-man assault marine units with jump packs and all that good stuff, they're probably realistically only going to be in range of four units to be able to charge, right? Now, out of those four, let's say your striking scorpions and your rangers manage to screen effectively two of those units. So you might lose a couple units on the first turn, but they're not going to be units that are more expensive than those assault marines. Now, on top of that, you also have a unit that can heroically intervene with fights first. So that's another unit that you have that can, you know, basically effectively deal with another of those assault marine squads. Now, there's one that's left unaccounted for, and this is the one that you kind of have to think about and... You know, it could be the trickiest to deal with. But if your build is correct, maybe you have an avatar of Kane or something like that, it's not a bad idea to overwatch. Now, if your opponent gets the first turn, you're only going to have one command point. So you have to choose whether or not you want to overwatch or whether you want to use heroic intervention. That is kind of a tricky kind of position to be in. But if you position your vulnerable units, like your swooping hawks, your warp spiders, you know, things you don't want in combat out of the initial charge range of those assault marines, you should be fine. 
your opponent is going to be charging things that are probably not of very much value, right? So if you had a unit of Storm Guardians, for example, kind of behind a wall, you know, kind of positioning themselves so your opponent couldn't charge in, that could essentially eliminate that unit from being able to charge. So there's a lot of things we can do, and I'm actually going to show you guys in just a second some examples of how you can position your units on the battlefield to evade most of your opponent's charges in any given turn, especially turn one. Because, of course, as we know, turn one is the hardest thing to deal with if your opponent gets it, right? If your opponent gets turn one on really short deployment zones, then, unfortunately, you know, you're just going to have to kind of screen with what you have from deployment. Now, having said that, for the examples, we are going to use the sweeping engagement because this is one of those boards that is really close together. If you look at the deployment zones, they're really close together, and it also is very dense in terrain. You have a lot of terrain there. You have a couple lanes of line of sight here and there. But for the most part, this seems very, very advantageous to melee infantry that is fast moving and can get up the board quickly. Okay, so first let's go over a simple example of what screening looks like. So in this case right here, we have a unit of five Terminators or maybe Assault Marines or whatever they are in the back on the very edge of your opponent's deployment zone. And it's actually at that part in the deployment zone where there's only about 14 inches between them and your own deployment zone. So you have deployed something maybe a little bit more fragile. Maybe it's a War Walker that you would plan to scout move. Or maybe it's a stronger target like the Avatar of Cain. So I like to tell players, if you are going to, you know, kind of put a unit on that very edge where it's closest to the enemy deployment zone, put something like Wraith Blades or the Avatar of Cain there because you want to put a unit on there that's going to be able to survive an assault or, of course, be able to survive being shot at. Now, of course, this isn't probably the preferred position you know, that I would put the avatar in, but let's just say for argument's sake, we have the avatar there. In front of the avatar, we have infiltrated a unit of five rangers, or maybe they're striking scorpions. Now, here's what we're going to do first turn. Your opponent is going to move forward, going to, you know, kind of get behind that ruined wall. Now, you might be wondering, well, why doesn't the unit just go straight for the rangers? Why does it hide behind that wall right there? So the answer is to prevent overwatch. Your opponent is not going to be wanting to take a free overwatch from the avatar. A good opponent will position their units behind that wall right there so that your avatar cannot see them. Now this also works in your advantage. It basically ensures that you can get your avatar in there if you need to. So let's say that's a unit of rangers right there. Now your opponent is really going to want to go after those rangers because they're the only target that it can really go after, right? Can't really go after the avatar of Kane too much as the Avatar will absolutely destroy them. And the Rangers seem to be a very you know, easy target to pick up in the early stages of the game and give you trouble later on. Now, here's where the clever part comes in. Rangers have an ability that allow them to move D6 after an enemy unit moves within 9 inches. So what you're going to do is one or two things. If that unit is in fact a threat to the Avatar of Cain, maybe it deals a bunch of mortal wound damage, or maybe it has some sort of ability that, you know, kind of harms the Avatar of Cain and prevents them from doing what they want to do next turn, then you can move the Rangers in front of the enemy unit with that D6 movement. You can kind of shimmy your unit over to make it impossible for the Avatar of Cain to be charged. So what you're going to do is one or two things. If that unit is a threat to the Avatar of Cain, it's either going to do a bunch of mortal wound damage or it's going to cripple the Avatar of Cain in some way. You will move the Ranger unit in front of that enemy unit and prevent the charge. If that unit is not a threat to the Avatar of Cain, but it's actually going after the Rangers, then you're going to move the Rangers back, hopefully at a charge range. But if not, then you can always use the Avatar of Cain to heroically intervene. And in fact, in both scenarios, it is going to be a negative trade for your opponent. So putting a very cheap unit next to a very powerful unit is a good way to kind of disable and disarm these units like Assault Marines and Thunderwolf Cavalry. And by the way, if this was Thunderwolf Cav, it'd be the same story. Thunderwolf Cav, not really that much of a threat to the Avatar of Cain, whereas they are a big threat to the Rangers. Thunderwolf Cav do not want to be gauged with the Avatar especially in a situation where you heroically intervene because your opponent is not going to want to lose their models like that in their own turn. So that is something to be aware of. Now, what your opponent might do instead, noticing this, if they're a really good player, noticing the trap they could potentially be walking into by killing the Rangers, 
they'll probably just move behind some obscuring terrain on the right-hand side of the battlefield. On the right-hand side of that L-shaped ruin in the middle, probably just going to go around it, stage for the next turn. That's the best they can do. And this actually is probably one of the better scenarios for us as well, because it gives us room to kind of maneuver around the battlefield. We're a very quick army. We want room to maneuver. We don't want to be given a lot of problems on turn one, so that's good. And it also means that your opponent is not dealing damage to our units early on. So our rangers can score an objective if they need to. You know, they can move to screen something else if they need to. Or they can simply walk forward, shoot some sniper rifles at that assault marine unit or whatever it is, and hope to kill one or two models or at least enough to where they're less of a threat to the other units in your army. So putting your opponent in positions like this where they don't have a lot of options is a really good way to stall your opponent out and prevent them from, you know, it's just diving deep into your back lines. But as we know, Warhammer 40k is a battle of many units, right? It's not a battle of just one unit versus one unit and trying to outplay the other. It's on a much bigger scale. So what that means is you're going to have to not only be aware of the unit that's you know, closest to your deployment zone, like the one I just went over, but you're going to have to be aware of multiple threats throughout the battlefield. You're going to have to be aware of line of sight. You're going to have to be aware of these different things. So in this example, I have set up a Blood Angels army or, you know, kind of a Space Marine Blood Angel-like army on the other side of the battlefield in red, and our Eldari are in yellow. Now, just like in the example, I have my Avatar of Cain or maybe even Yinkarn right there in the front of the deployment zone. Now, of course, the only reason why they're there is because my opponent deployed in such a way that there's nothing in the area that can generally threaten the Avatar of Cain or Yinkarn. So I feel safer deploying it there knowing that, right? I wouldn't deploy it there, for example, if they had, you know, two full units of death company ready to, you know, kind of charge them down and stuff like that. No, no, no. I, <laughs> I wouldn't do that in that case. But in this case, we have a unit of five assault marines right there on the opposite side of the deployment zone, you know, in the middle of the battlefield you see, and on the right-hand side you see a rhino with probably, you know, 10 death company in it. Or perhaps two units of five, whatever it might be. Now, on the left-hand side of the battlefield, we have our falcons or fire prisms, whatever they are, protected by a unit of Howling Banshees. Now, this unit of Howling Banshees has Jane Czar in it, but this could be anything, right? This could be a unit of Quins with the Vizark and with the Rain, right? It just depends on what you have in your army list. And we've actually moved them up from the deployment zone, so you see them a little bit there. Now, if you didn't get first turn, they wouldn't be exactly right there. They'd actually be a little bit farther back, but it still basically serves the same purpose. They're there to prevent the Falcons or the unit of Storm Guardians from getting charged from something like Assault Marines, which, you know, Storm Guardians will lose that Assault, obviously. Now, as you can also see, I have my Storm Guardians set up in such a way that they are exactly one inch behind the wall right there. And according to the new GW Tournament FAQ packet, whatever they released for, you know, Pariah Nexus as far as their competitive play goes, they say, specifically in there, that wall blocking, or essentially positioning your unit in such a way that your opponent can't actually charge you because you're more than you're a little bit more than one inch away from the wall, and your opponent can't actually fit the base of their model in between the wall and your unit. So there's no way that they can actually charge. They're going to have to charge around, and guess what is waiting for them right there if they do charge around? A unit of Howling Banshees with Jane Czar. So even if my opponent can charge me in my own deployment zone turn one, they obviously can't because of how I've placed my units. Or at least it's not a good idea, right? They could charge them in there, but Jane's R with free heroic intervention is easily just going to, you know, kind of wipe them out. Now, that's for that side of the battlefield. It is protected. You see an Autark Wayleaper kind of on that side of the battlefield as well, just screening out enemy units. Because as you guys also know, there are mission rules now which allow battle line units to come in from strategic reserve on turn one so we're trying to prevent that as much as possible now as we go to the right side of the battlefield we go to the middle we have again like i said the avatar and the you know rangers or striking scorpions or whatever they are right there we have a unit of nine wind riders tucked into that little piece of terrain right there and that is simply because we want a clear line of sight to your opponent's forces that come through there so if your opponent wants to move assault marines into there they're going to have to take some overwatch 
So, in other words, we have prevented our opponent from being able to actually assault our units turn one, once again. We can also see unit of five warp spiders on the right flank. They're there just to kind of chill and wait for an opportunity to strike. Again, because of that overwatch denial, or I should say the overwatch that the wind riders can provide, they're not going to be threatened by anything coming from their left. And lastly, we do have a death jester by the ruin on the left-hand side of the battlefield by that, you know, big L in our deployment zone. We have a death jester right behind the, you know, vertical ruin right there. And, you know, beside that little piece of, you know, obscuring terrain in the center of our deployment zone, we have a solitaire for, again, heroic intervention. Just in case they decide to brave the overwatch and charge our wind riders anyway. And lastly, of course, we have a unit of five striking scorpions on the left-hand side of the battlefield, about nine inches away from that squad of assault marines opposite them. Now, this is simply because if we get first turn, we get to charge them and kill them. But if we don't get first turn, that is actually blocking. What they're doing right there is they're blocking your opponent from being able to move their big vehicle. So maybe a repulsor or something like that, maybe a predator annihilator or something that could really put some damage on our avatar. We have them in that position to prevent that. Now, the other cool thing is we can also, if we get first turn, charge that tank. They can overwatch us, but again, that's a waste of CP. They're not going to be able to do as many cool stuff with their, you know, Blood Angels, you know, stratagems and stuff like that, that they could normally do if we're forcing them to use overwatch early on in the game. And truthfully, if it's an anti-large platform, it's really not going to do that much damage to a unit of striking scorpions. You're still going to be able to charge it and hold it up into combat. It is going to have to fall back and, you know, it's not going to be able to shoot that turn if it does so, Right. So we've kind of put our striking scorpions in a position that whether or not we get first turn, the scorpions are still going to do a good job at, you know, preventing your opponent from doing what they want to do. So overall, as you can see, this type of deployment makes it very hard for our opponent to do anything on the first turn. They have a lot of choices and all of them are bad. They're going to lose units whichever or however they do it unless they play very conservatively, which again plays into our strengths. If our opponent is playing conservatively with their assault units, then we've already won, guys. It's that simple, right? If you allow the Eldar player to move how they want to and target the units that they want to at their leisure, they're going to win every single game. Now, having said that, I realize that this army is a certain build, right? I have built this around the idea that I'm going to be at some point going against an assault army. And I'm going to have to deny them in multiple different ways, right? I have a big Overwatch target, which is, of course, the Wind Riders. I have several units with fights first. I have the Solitaire and Wind, or not Wind Riders, sorry, Howling Banshees and Jane Zar in there as well, right? I have the Avatar of Kane, which is also a good target for heroic intervention. So I have a lot of melee-type units in the army. I even have Storm Guardians, although they're mostly there for sticky objectives and screening and stuff like that. Now... Having said that, a lot of you guys don't have armies that look like this. You don't have units of Howling Banshees. You don't bring the Solitaire. You know, you don't bring a you, you know, large unit of Wind Riders with you to Overwatch. And I think what you guys have to wrap your head around is that people that aren't bringing these types of units, I mean, you don't have to bring every single unit that I'm bringing here, obviously. But if you're not bringing something to deny enemy assault squads, whether it be, you know, screening units or fights first units, or a combination of both, you're kind of stuck in the beginning of the edition when it was very shooty, right? The beginning of the edition, by the way, guys, combat didn't really have a place in it. Combat was so awful in comparison with shooting. I mean, if you guys remember, people were dissing combat left and right. But steadily, GW has buffed combat. They have buffed the ability of combat units to get engaged with enemies. And as a result of all those buffs, we're at a place now where it's a very melee-dominant meta. So, having said that, to wrap it up, if your army is still stuck in a place where it was in September or August, where you're running a lot of shooting units and you're not running a lot of screening or, you know, close combat units that can fight first, then you're going to be at a severe disadvantage against these new types of armies that are coming out. And you're probably going to have to think of riskier ways to prevent your units from getting charged. So if you are running Fire Prisms, for example, and you don't have as much screening as you would like, maybe you don't have two units of Infiltrators, right? Maybe you don't have a unit of Shroud Runners that can, you know, kind of block for you. In those cases, if you have a Wave Serpent, if you have a Falcon, 
you might want to, you know, consider using those to move up the battlefield, plug a hole in those movement lanes, and maybe move up your Farseer behind a ruin so that you can, you know, get an automatic six for an overwatch on a Brightlands. That way your Falcon at least does something before it dies in a series of chain swords and hammer blows, right? Now, it may seem wasteful to use your Falcon in that way, but if it prevents a unit from cycling through three or four units of your Aspect Warriors, then it's an absolutely good trade, right? If you're sacrificing a Falcon for a full unit of Death Company or a big unit of Terminators or something like that, and they end up killing that Falcon, but then they die in return because you've set it up in such a way that they would die in return from you know any number of sources of your firepower, then you've basically won that trade. Yes, you've lost the Falcon, but you have gained the ability to kill that unit, which would normally probably, you know, charge one one or more of your units in your own backfield, destroy them, and then consolidate into something else, basically preventing you from doing what you want to do. And again, if the Eldar player is trapped in their deployment zone, then you're not going to win the game, right? You're not going to win the game by the objectives, and you're certainly not going to have the line of sight necessary to be able to kill enemy units. So when you guys are planning out your deployment and you are planning out the list you're going to bring to either tournaments or wherever it is, you do want to make sure you know your local meta first of all, of course, because if your opponents are still not bringing any kind of assault units, then you might not have to worry about this. But there, again, is an evolving meta with assault armies and units like Howling Banshees with Jane Czar, the Solitaire, right? They can help you in a lot of big ways in being able to deal with those different types of assault armies that have been, you know, kind of dominating the win rate in competitive play. So in conclusion, with melee armies dominating Prion Nexus and us being a faction that is not necessarily known for its melee, a lot of armies are struggling, right? A lot of armies are struggling to adapt to the change. However, with proper placement of screening units, heroic intervention units with fights first, and effective overwatch, pretty much you can neutralize many of the early threats against your army. And if you can neutralize those early threats, then it is going to be much easier for you to play the rest of the game out, right? If you can kill three or four units of assault marines before they get into your lines, right? Or as they get into your lines when you heroically intervene, your game is going to be so much easier because you don't have to worry about getting move blocked. You don't have to worry about getting penned in your own deployment zone. And from there, you can go on to pick off their more vulnerable units and key targets and dominate the battlefield. Okay, so that's going to be it for today's video. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comment section what you have found effective against melee armies. I would love to know what you guys think about it as well. Despite the misconceptions, I think the Eldar do have some pretty strong melee units for the cost now. You know, we have Striking Scorpions being much cheaper, Condress. We have Jane's and Howling Banshees. We have Quins, which are very good. We have a lot of better options now than we did at the beginning of the edition, that's for sure. So don't lose hope, guys. I know some of the numbers coming out of competitive play don't look great right now. I think they will probably improve, but Eldar players have to be willing to adapt, right? There are changes that are not going to allow somebody to run the same army effectively as they did in September, now in July, right? So you just kind of have to think about in what ways you can change your game plan up and adapt to, you know, what you might be facing on the battlefield. And real quick, once again, I also want to thank my patrons and supporters for supporting the channel over the last year and a half, almost two years now. Your help has greatly improved the channel and helped it grow so much. So thank you once again to the community. If you do want to join the channel's Patreon and help support the channel, I do have free trials activated, which will grant you permanent access to our Discord community, which is a community of Eldar players and enthusiasts who love talking about strategy, tactics, and of course, hobbying. I will leave the link for that in the description below. I'm also an Amazon affiliate and have a channel store page, so if you want to pick up some Eldar-inspired apparel on the channel store page or some discounted miniatures on Amazon, I will leave those links in the description also. All right, everybody, that is going to be it for today's video. Thanks for watching once again, and go ahead and leave a comment and tell me what you guys think about the Eldar's ability to counter melee armies. Have a good one, everybody, and peace out.